Hi everyone and welcome to today's video here on the Yoga by Candice YouTube channel. Today we are going to be doing video number two in our four part video series on restorative yoga. This video is brought to you by Carolina Morning who is so generous enough to send me these bolsters that I have here that I'll be using in the video. So I'm loving these bolsters for so many reasons. Um, first and foremost because of their exceptional quality. I also love that they are rectangular so you have lots of different height options when you go to practice and I love that they're a US based company so check them out you can find them at zafu.net z-a-f-u dot n-e-t and I'll put the link in the description box so you can check them out without further ado find a seat on your mat and we'll get started So in the first video, I talked about um, what restorative yoga is and what restorative yoga isn't. So if you haven't seen that video, um, give that a look. I'll put the link in the description box below so you can check that out if you need a little bit more information. And then at the end, we did two yoga poses together. This video is also going to be mostly informational. And what I mean by that is we're not gonna be doing a yoga practice the entire time, but towards the end, we'll do a couple poses together. This is just kind of like an informational video to help you understand what restorative yoga is a bit more. And we're gonna talk about uh, what you need to do before um, really settling into the practice. And then I'm also gonna talk a bit about sequencing. So let's jump into it. The most common struggle that I hear that people have with restorative yoga is that they can't turn their mind off and relax. I think, I don't know if it's just like the American culture, which is just go, go, go. And even a lot of Europe as well is just go, 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 work, work, work. Um, Europe, not as much, but USA for sure. And so I think that that also translates to how we physically move our bodies. Like a lot of us are really into HIIT style workouts or Tabata or something where you're like really pushing yourself very hard. And I do think that's healthy to a certain extent. I think that's really great for fast twitch mu muscle fiber activation. It's really great for building strength. I also think it's really good um, for our cardiovascular health. But I think that we have to have a sense of balance. And that's why I really love restorative yoga. So the same people who are really into like HIIT style workouts, those are gonna be people who really love vinyasa, power flow style yoga. So if you're watching this, you probably know that all yoga is not the same, that some yoga is faster and more athletic and more like effort based. And then you have yoga like restorative yoga, which has almost no effort involved. You're meant to just kind of melt and relax and unwind and restore. Um, so I find that when people come to restorative yoga, they're like almost expecting to have to work and not having to work is work for them. And I'm, I completely know what that's like. When I first came to restorative yoga, I didn't really like it at all. And I just felt like it wasn't a workout. It's doing nothing for my mind except stressing me out. And I just couldn't focus or concentrate and I didn't really find any benefit. I was also like 15 years old. So, <laughs> so there was that aspect to it as well. And then when I got more heavily into yoga, like in my twenties, I still didn't really love it. And it was only really in the last, like, I don't know, seven to 10 years where I really started to love it so much and really enjoy that, that activation of just like turning the thought switch off and allowing myself to think nothing and just like melt and be and finding this really great space between being active and alive and vibrant and being asleep because you're not really asleep at all but you're not really like fully awake either so I liked finding that middle ground and I liked the challenge of finding that middle ground after a while but it did take me some years to really fully appreciate um, the practice and get it so let's address some of those issues. The very first issue that comes to mind is 
um, the monkey mind where you, you come into your pose and then you're like, I have to do all these other things. Why am I wasting an hour of my time? I've got a to-do list a mile long. Oh, remember that email I have to respond to? So all these thoughts are running around in your mind and all of a sudden you're like, this is not serving me in any way. This is just kind of stressing me out. So if you're somebody like that, what I would say to do is to see if you can Listen, if to-do lists are on your mind, <laughs> I guess before you go to, the, to practice restorative yoga, just write down your to-do list or write down, do kind of like a brain dump. And then that way, everything that's on your mind is on a piece of paper so you're not gonna forget it. And you can just let yourself have this time on your mat almost like self-care. Like for this next you know, 20, 30, 45, one hour, I'm just going to take care of myself and I'm not gonna think about anything else. And that's kind of what you can do and you can prepare yourself for that by doing that brain dump on a piece of paper so you know in the back of your mind like, okay, everything that I've got going on in my life is on this piece of paper so I don't have to think about it or worry about it. It'll be there for me when I get up out of the practice. The other thing you can that like kind of stresses people out is wondering, am I doing this right? So maybe you're not thinking about the things on your to-do list, but maybe you're like, Oh, did someone's phone just buzz and vibrate? Oh, I wish they had turned it off. Oh, I'm a little bit cold. Hmm, I can't really hear the teacher. Should I say something? I don't wanna interrupt her. And like you have this kind of narration going on in your head and then you're like, am I doing this right? Because I'm not really stressed out about what I have to do in the future, but I can't seem to like just fall into this zone and get in the zone really quickly. So what do I do and am I doing this right? Well. Uh, no, you're probably not like doing it right, but you're closer than the person who's like thinking about all the things they have to do in their to-do list, right? Because at least you're in the moment, so there's that. One thing I would advise is I think that sometimes when we talk about meditation or a slower style yoga practice, there's this common thought that we have to be able to turn off our brain. And the fact of the matter is, I don't think you necessarily have to turn it off so that you think nothing and there's no brain activity going on, but I think there's a nice, I'm a really visual person, so one of the things I picture in my mind's eye is a light switch. And I just like think of that, think of my thoughts and that constant narration. You know when you're watching a TV and there's like that ticker at the bottom of the television, that's like kind of how our brains are. They're constantly narrating. We don't really need that narration. So what I picture in my mind's eye is a light switch. And I just think, okay, just for right now, I'm gonna turn this light switch off and let that ticker just turn off. And I picture it in my mind's eye like a TV and just clunk, I turn it off. I know it's there if I want to turn it back on and that kind of eases any stress or anxiety that might come up, but I picture a light switch. Another image that might work for you if you're more of a visual person, think of a volume knob and you can just say like, okay, just for right now, I'm gonna turn the volume of my thoughts just down a little bit so I can focus on the task at hand, which is relaxing and not thinking about all the things. So that might be something that's really helpful to you, or if you're a teacher and you, you're not really sure how to convey that, you could use those two images and see if they help people. So essentially, you wanna give yourself a little bit of time to quiet our minds, because our minds have like, <laughs> they've not really evolved with the rest of our body, so our mind is constantly thinking about trying to keep us safe. And so, in, but instead of like being on the lookout for tigers and lions and bears, like way, way, way back thousands of years ago, it's thinking about the to-do list. Am I doing this right? This is stressing me out. Narration, all the things, right? Giving us constantly this like low level stress or anxiety or just the noise of the narration. And so, if you begin your practice, the best thing you can do to have a successful practice and a nice fully and truly restorative practice is to give yourself that time to just settle in and let your mind quiet down and calm down. You can think of your brain like a small child and it just needs, needs a minute to just cool down and chill out. So before you really drop into the practice itself, give yourself some time to relax and just kind of get in the zone. So how do we do that? 
Well, a couple things. You could start seated like this and just take a couple deep breaths in. Let's do that together to see what that feels like because a lot of the day, we're just going through our day breathing without really thinking about breathing and often we are breathing shallowly. What that means is that we're not really using our lungs to their fullest capacity, so we don't get that deep diaphragmatic breath. We get kind of like a shallow breath. And yes, we do, we do use our diaphragm because you can't breathe without your diaphragm, but it's not, uh, it's not like a full, relaxing, restorative breath. So we're often breathing up here very shallowly. And if you're a very stressed out kind of person, then you're probably talking really fast and you're moving around and your muscles are up here as you drive, which also can like conflicts with how your body wants to breathe. And so we don't really do ourselves any favors when we're just like rushing from thing to thing to thing and not taking the time to be still or take a few mindful breaths. So that can really do wonders for our parasympathetic nervous system when we stop to take those deep breaths. So sit really tall, and if you find it uncomfortable to sit tall like this, and a lot of people do, especially if they have tight hips, one of the things you'll notice if you're a teacher or you'll, you'll notice in yourself if you're a student, if you're sitting like this and it's uncomfortable for you, then what's happening probably is that your, your low back is kind of reaching back behind you. This is called a posterior tilt of your pelvis. So you would want your pelvis to be like this, and what this is doing is elongating my spine. But if you're restricted through your, your hips and you have tight hips, then you might be like this. <laughs> and if that's the case, just grab a block, or you could even sit on the edge of your blanket, or you could sit on the edge of your bolster, and just sit on the very edge. You don't want to have it like jammed underneath you because then it doesn't really tilt your pelvis forward enough. So just sit on the very edge of it like this, and what this does is help to give your pelvis a little bit of a tilt that it needs so that you can sit comfortably nice and tall. And the reason why we want to sit nice and tall if we're practicing our breathing is because when we're hunched over like this, your lungs can't really, they don't have a whole lot of space. So imagine you're like a lung and you're crouched into like a phone booth like this and you can't really expand. You can't get any good breaths in. So that's why we want to sit up nice and tall and that opens up all the space here for our lungs to take a nice deep breath in. So roll your shoulders back because once again, if we're like this, then our lungs don't have a lot of room to breathe and move. So roll your shoulders back. You can choose to close your eyes or not. Tilt your chin until you feel like it is parallel to the ground. And what that does is bring, it helps to bring our cervical spine in a nice neutral position. And then take a deep breath in through your nose. And as you do, imagine that you're filling up your belly first, and then halfway through the breath, your ribs feel like they are expanding laterally to the side. And at the very, very, very top of that breath, take one more sip into the chest area. And then exhale the same way you, you from the reverse. So exhale from the chest first, then let the mid ribs go in to their neutral position. And as you exhale and finish that exhale, draw your belly button in towards your spine to completely empty the lungs. And let's do that a couple more times. So big breath in, belly, ribs, and chest. And at the very top of that inhale, see if you can breathe into the top of your upper back. And then exhale, upper back, chest then the ribs, and then the belly. And let's do that three more times on our own. And at the end of that exhale, flutter your eyes open. And you can see just a few deep breaths can really change what's going on in your mind and how you physically feel. If for some reason you still feel like you need a little bit more, you could do a pranayama exercise. 
So one of those pranayama exercises would be something like inhaling, and you always want to link your breath with your movement. So inhale and turn your head to the right. It's going to look like your left on the screen, because I'm not mirroring. Exhale, come back to center. Inhale, turn your head to the left. Exhale, back to center. Inhale, take your face up towards the sky. Exhale, back to center. Keeping your spine tall, inhale, take chin to chest. And exhale, back to center. Do that one more time through. So it's right, left, up, down. When you're ready, flutter your eyes open. And that helps to continue to calm down the parasympathetic nervous system. Some breathing exercises I wouldn't do are like the skull shining breath, or also known as like breath of fire. So that's where you like take a deep breath in and you're like, you exhale very quickly. So it's like, I wouldn't do that one because it's very awakening and we want to calm your system down. We don't want to like fire it up. Another one I wouldn't do, I mean, you might, you might see this in a restorative yoga class, but I personally probably wouldn't teach this at the beginning of a restorative class, Nadi Shahana, Shodhana. Um, Pranayama, which is where you take a thumb to the nostril, to the right nostril, breathe in through your left. Plug left, breathe out through right, and so on. And the reason why I wouldn't do that is because it's very awakening for the brain. It's a really great thing to do maybe at the end of a restorative yoga class, if your class is in the beginning of the day or in the afternoon where people would then leave or you have to like do stuff after this class. Um, I would, I would do it to kind of wake yourself up, but I wouldn't do it in preparation for the restorative yoga um, practice. Another pranayama exercise I would not do is um, the one where you kind of stick your tongue out and you curl it up and then breathe in like it's a straw. So it's close your mouth and breathe out through your nose. And the reason why I wouldn't do that is because it's a cooling breath. It's really great to do on like a hot summer's day or towards the, you know, the afternoon slump if you're trying to wake yourself up. But I wouldn't do it for a restorative yoga class because you're probably already kind of chilly um, because you're not really moving at all <laughs> in a restorative yoga class. So I really wouldn't do um, I really wouldn't do that. The one that we did at the beginning where you turn your head right, left, up, down, that's it's just a very gentle um, moving of the joints. It's not really awakening. So that's where I would, that's the one I would kind of suggest if you need to, um, if you need just a, a little more in order to fall in and, and get rid of like whatever else might be on your mind. If you need to just kind of recenter and refocus yourself, that's the one I would do. I might also do the three part breath which is what we did when we took our deep breaths and we did belly, ribs, chest, um, just super long, really intentional deep breaths that'll help you to just kind of quiet down the chatter in your mind. So those are the, the breathing exercises I would do to kind of settle yourself. Another thing you could do also before you get to the settle yourself part is actually move around. So if you're super stressed out and you know that the restorative yoga practice is going to be really good for you, but you have a really tough time, like your, your body just wants to move, what I would do is actually move around. So if you want to do a very short, like five or 10 minute vinyasa flow, or you want to do a sun salutation or something like that, just to kind of like 
dance it out and get it out of your system, kind of like with puppies, you know, or with dogs in general. Like before they will settle down and, and rest, they've got to get that energy out. So they'll run around, they'll play, and then, then they can calm down. So if you feel like your body really needs to move first, feel free to do a more athletic practice or athletic um, workout and then come to the restorative piece and start with your breathing exercises and then you know come into the practice. So just make it work for you and find instead you know I think a lot of people get really frustrated because they're like oh meditation doesn't work for me or restorative yoga it's just not for me. Well it can be for you but we just have to find the right path to get there. So just know that there's real really no right or wrong way to kind of prepare for it. Just do what works best for you. So now that we're ready to practice restorative yoga, we want to think about sequencing. And I say this for a couple reasons. One, if you're a yoga teacher, um, probably your, your yoga teacher training uh, went over this. If it didn't, you should um, maybe consider coming to our yoga teacher training. Um, I'll be hosting one in April 2020 in Santorini, Greece. And I'll be hosting a 300-hour a one in Thailand in July of 2020. Okay, but if you are just a student and you're gonna practice on your own, here's some things to think about. And in my teacher trainings, we go way in depth, but this is just like a quick thing to keep in the back of your mind. You don't really want to have people be going up, down, up, down, moving around. So in the very first video, I said in a typical 60 minute class, you might have only four to six restorative yoga poses, which means you're really holding them for quite some time. So you have to know what poses you're gonna do ahead of time to make sure that it's going to work for your body and that it's a comprehensive practice for whatever your intention is. So for example, if we're just going for like a total body um, relaxation, restorative practice, we might do poses that are gonna target the hips, the chest, um, the, the glutes, that sort of thing, the low back. So we wanna think about all of these things as we, we wanna think about the muscle groups we want to hit in our sequencing as we sequence it out. But one thing to consider is because it's such a quiet, gentle, restorative practice, we don't want people to be in, like let's say, Let's say we wanna have supported fish pose, which is this. So it's a supported fish pose and we're also supporting the low back with the, the knees over the bolster. So we wanted to go from here and we also want to do caterpillar pose, which is this. And we also want to do an inner thigh stretch, which would be this. And we also want to do, what's another one we could do? A downward facing rest pose, which is this. So we wouldn't start from here Imagine, you know, you get yourself here, you're relaxing, 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 you know, five minutes later, you get up, you're just, you're probably like so zenned out. The last thing you wanna do is get up, sit here, pull the thing, turn it around, straighten your legs, put your arm, it's just too much, it's too much moving around. So you wanna think strategically about how you're going to sequence your four poses or whatever you're gonna do in a way that requires as little movement as possible. So what I would probably do is I would maybe start it, there's, I mean, there's no real right way to do it. I can think of a couple different ways that would probably feel nice, but just off the top of my head, I would probably start in the downward facing rest, like this. So they're here, and then I would just cue them to like turn the bolster like this, or I would do it myself it was just, if it was just a self-practice, and bring the bolster around my side and come into this one. 
because there was such little movement. So my, my body is generally still in the same position. And then I would slide the leg back and have the other one on this side, take it over to the other side. Da, 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 da. We're here for five minutes, slide my leg back. And then I would probably gracefully cue like a, just a regular child's pose. You can like quote unquote flow a little bit between poses. So you're not actually flowing because we're not gonna do an, an actual vinyasa or a downward dog or anything, but you could take a quick child's pose like this and then slowly walk your way up and send your legs out in front. And then we'll do the caterpillar pose. Then we're here. And now my body, if you look at the shape of my body, half of me is where we want it to be for our final pose, which was that supported fish. So after five minutes, I would come up, bend the legs, rotate out with the bolster, place the legs over, send my bolster back, and send myself back. Ah, feels so nice. So that's what I would do, but I mean, sometimes it's tough because there is going to be movement. There's no way that you could have like a really nice, comprehensive, restorative yoga class where there's zero movement at all. So don't feel bad if you have to move, you have to have people move around between poses or if you yourself, if you're practicing for yourself and you've designed it you know, for your own self-practice and you have to move around a lot, that's okay. We just wanna think strategically about it and have as minimal movement as possible so that people stay in that zened out, chilled out, melty kind of in-between state where they're not totally awake and not totally asleep. So the less complicated you can make it for them or for yourself, the better practice they'll have. So think strategically about how you're going to practice, and, um, and that's my, my biggest tip. We really also want to avoid doing back bends, forward folds, back bends, forward folds, because that's not great for our spine, so that's another thing to keep in mind. But for the most part, you want to just think about having your body shaped um, in the correct position so that the next pose that's coming is like sort of similar in that to that shape. So just keep that in mind. So what I'd like to do now is do those four poses with you. So bring your bolster to the back of your mat. Let's set up our, let's set ourselves up for success. So we'll bring the other bolster to our left, just off the mat. Then come down face down and place your shins on your bolster. And you can place your hands on top of one another and just rest your forehead here. And take a couple deep breaths in. Now there are a few ways to do this if you are leading a class or if you are doing a self-practice. You could just say nothing and let yourself chill out and zen out. Or you could do kind of like a self-guided meditation. So you could start at the top of your head and begin to skin your body down the back of the head and then skin your body through the arms. And because the arms are bent and the shoulders are kind of up, you might ask yourself if there's is there any tension in the shoulders that maybe you could let go of? Can you become a little heavier in the shoulders? Can you relax a little bit of the tension between the shoulder blades? As you breathe in, can you breathe into your upper back? As you scan your body down your back, can you feel your hips super heavy? Can you feel your legs fully supported on your bolster? Can you feel the earth below you fully supporting your body as you melt?
Can you let go of your intentional breathing and just let your breath come on its own? But focus specifically on your exhales for total relaxation. If your mind begins to wonder, just bring it back to the moment. And then as you're ready, bringing a little bit of awareness to your feet, taking your left foot to the side of your bolster and just sliding it out to the right so that the bolster is to your right, just off your mat. And then bring your left leg to rest fully on the mat. And externally rotate your right leg and lift it onto the bolster. And exhale through your nose. Big breath in through your nose. And this time exhale through your mouth. And bringing your awareness once again to the top of your head. And slowly scanning your body, the same parts as last time, and just checking in and noticing what's different in this pose compared to the last pose. Bringing some awareness to your right leg. To the inner thigh. Just noticing the heaviness of the body. The support that the bolster provides. Allowing this to be mostly effortless here. And then as you're ready, slowly slide your right leg back behind you. And just taking a second, take a deep breath in. Exhale. Noticing what it feels like to have both legs fully extended behind you and noticing if there's a difference between what you feel on the right side compared to the left. And then as you're ready, externally rotating your left leg and bringing it up onto the bolster on your left side. And as you settle in here, once again, bringing some awareness to the top of your head and following it all the way down. Paying attention to the left side this time and just noticing what's going on through the left leg, if anything. How does this side compare to the other side? And whether there is or isn't a difference doesn't really matter. It's more about just being aware and tuning in and noticing. So allowing your breath to come on its own. Noticing heaviness and almost like a sinking sensation with each exhale as you totally relax and let go of any tension You can always think about the big places where tension may hide, like the hips or the shoulders. But you can also think about the smaller pockets of tension, like the corners of the eyes, the space between the eyebrows, the corners of the mouth or the jaw.
and then using your breath to just relax those areas. As you're ready, beginning to extend your left leg back behind you. Taking a moment here to notice what it feels like to have both legs extended back behind you. And is there a difference between how you feel on the left compared to the right? As you inhale, Send your hands underneath your shoulders. You can keep your eyes closed if that feels good. And then press your hips back to your heels for a child's pose. And then as you inhale, rise up. You can send your feet out to the right. Your hips can come down to the ground. And send the bolster that's on your right out in front of you and extend your legs out in front. You can extend your legs like so. If this is not comfortable for you, you can just bend your legs and place your feet on the ground. And you can draw the bolster in towards you and then stack your hands. If your head still doesn't reach, just use whatever props you have. Like a block could be nice and you just bring the forehead down. Use whatever props you have. You just want to be as comfortable as possible so that you can totally let go. You don't want to have any tension where you have to hold yourself up or anything like that. So do whatever you need to do and use whatever props you have to make yourself as comfortable as possible. And then as you arrive into the pose, see if you can scan your body once again from your head down and just check in and ask yourself, can I let go a bit more? Can I be heavier here? This is a nice stretch for the back. So as you breathe in, see if you can breathe into the back. And as you breathe out, see if you can become heavier, feeling fully supported, letting go with ease and trust, allowing heaviness from the arms and the shoulders. Each exhale, a little bit more relaxation. As you're ready, Bring some awareness to your head and your hands and slowly press into your hands to lift your head and keep your eyes the soft gaze and we'll slide the bolster that's on your left back behind you in line with your spine and the bolster that's in front of you will just turn it perpendicular to the mat and drape your legs over top. If you have a blanket, you can use your blanket and just spread it over your body or your legs or whatever feels good. Bring the bolster that's back behind you in line with your spine and then push it about halfway, or sorry, a third of the way back and slowly send your way back. And you can open up your arms out to the side, palms facing up. With your eyes closed, take a deep breath in through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. 
And just allow your chest to gently open up, allow your arms to be heavy. If you find that your arms are hanging off your bolster, we definitely don't want that. So you'll use your blocks in line with the forearms to fully support the weight of the arms. If you don't need the blocks and your arms feel comfortable and they're resting on the ground, you can leave them as is. If you don't feel like this is enough of a stretch for your chest, you can turn your bolster the other way so you have a little bit more height. With your eyes closed, bring some awareness to the top of your head and slowly scan over the crown of the head and the back of the head, just noticing the bolster underneath supporting you. Noticing the openness of the chest as you make your way around the front and you bring some awareness to your face. Seeing if you can close your mouth but part your teeth and allow the tongue to sink into the bottom of the mouth. What does that feel like to just let go? See if you can bring some awareness to the tops of your cheeks, the corners of the eyes, the space between the eyebrows. Just allowing yourself to release any little pockets of tension you find using your breath and using the awareness of the power of your exhale to let yourself move with ease into a place of total relaxation, knowing that there's nowhere else to be, nothing else to do. You are exactly where you are meant to be. Continuing the awareness down your chest and into your hips. Noticing the weight of the pelvis and how it is fully supported by your mat and the ground underneath your mat. Noticing the legs and the heaviness of the legs and how there's no effort to just allow your legs to melt into your bolster. If you have a blanket on, just noticing the weight of the blanket and the warmth that the blanket creates. And just allowing yourself to totally relax. Taking the pressure off and giving yourself this moment of pure relaxation. Letting go of your intentional breathing and letting your breath just come on its own. giving yourself permission to go into that space between totally awake and alert and asleep. Just finding that happy middle ground. As you're ready, beginning to wiggle your fingers and your toes. Maybe placing your feet slowly on your, the top of your bolster. And then as you're ready, bringing your hands down by your sides. And slowly and mindfully pressing into your forearms to lift your head. And then into your hands to lift your body finding your way into a comfortable seat. 
So that is how I would sequence those four poses. If I were teaching the class, I would go much slower and I would also walk around the room. Actually teaching restorative yoga is so much more demanding in my opinion than a vinyasa class because I do try to walk around the room and move quietly, move the props um, to a place where they can easily access them based on the position that they're in so, they, they, so that they can get into the next pose easily and quickly and without having to do too much complicated movement. So actually, I'm the one sweating when I'm teaching a restorative yoga class. I did find that talking you through these particular poses was really challenging, especially when I was on my belly, because I felt like I couldn't get enough air in to continue to talk. Um, so I apologize if it was like really breathy because I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. So I apologize for that. Um, and I also apologize for going a little quicker than I normally would. Um, part of the reason was that I couldn't really breathe, so <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, that's how I would do it, and I would encourage you to consider, um, you know, when you're designing your own restorative yoga practices, to keep those points that we talked about in mind, setting yourself up for success by really calming your mind down, quieting your mind down with some breath work, or maybe a little actual active yoga first or active workout first, then do the breath work, and then come into your poses. The other thing you might have noticed is that there was extra time between each pose. Like it took a minute to like get from pose A to pose B, and then it took another little, you know, minute or two to settle in to pose B. So keep that in mind as well. Don't rush it. Just let yourself really enjoy each breath in the pose and allow yourself to totally relax if you can. I hope that you guys enjoyed this second video in the four part video series on restorative yoga. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below and I will answer in the next video that I create or if not, I will answer your comment um, in the comment sections because I always do try to read each and every comment on my channel. So thanks so much for tuning in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you feel like it might behoove somebody in your life to watch this video, please share it with them. That would really mean the world to me. I also have an app which is called Yoga by Candice. It's just one word. You can find it in the iTunes app store. The Android Google version is coming soon. But if you have a friend who might benefit from this video or others that I've done, you could just tell them to download the app and they'll have access to the hundreds and hundreds of yoga videos that I have there as well as access to my blog where we have daily content Monday through Friday. So thanks so much again for tuning in and I'll see you very soon here on the YBC YouTube channel. Take care.